Matt Yasa here. We'll be looking at how to make colored tubing today. And I'll start out by using my jacks to flare open this tubing and I'm thickening up the lip extra thick for the technique called the coil pot. And now you might have noticed I used mostly clear tubing for all my videos. And when it comes to colored tubing, there isn't a very large selection and it's usually a little bit more expensive than it would be to just buy the rods and make your own. It does take time to make though. There are some techniques that are a little bit better, but take a little bit more time to set up. But this technique, the coil pot, is great for making a smaller section of tubing. And as the name implies, I'm basically just coiling the glass onto this tube to form the coil pot. I'll go in from time to time to flare it back open with the jacks, and then continue with the coiling. I'm trying not to let that hole close up at the end. I always want to keep it open. But as you coil around, it tends to pull the glass in a little bit every time you circle. So I'll go in with my jacks on one blade first, just because the hole is so small, and then go in with two. And the jacks is a more traditional glass blowing tool. It's very versatile. It allows you to open up small holes and to flare the holes open very wide. And then it allows you to do shaping on the opposite end. You can more of a surface flat on the paddle and then on the curved spring, you can do a, a shaping for a neck. It's traditionally used a lot to make goblets and bottles, a lot of drinking glasses. And if you see a little smoke or fire coming off of my pair, that's because it's a beeswax. It's always good to protect your tools by waxing them up. As the wax melts, it creates a layer of vapor between the hot glass and the tool. I'm also marvering the outside of the tube with the paddle. Once I do that, I marver the inside of the tube with the jacks. And I just keep going back and forth until I get a nice, solid, even tube. And this color is slime from tag glass. It kind of reminds me of ectoplasm from Ghostbusters. Now when I pop this hole, I want to do it inside the flame. That way I don't get any bubble trash like I did in the last video. That last video was just crazy, but it was pretty cool looking when it popped. Now for my punty, I'm going to use the same rod that I coiled on there. That way when I break it off later, I don't have to worry about any clear glass. It'll just be a little bit of that colored glass. I'll just melt right back in. And then for the other side though, I'll have to remove the clear glass from the tubing. I can use the tubing itself as a tool to remove it. And then I'm gonna go in with my jacks to finish off that side that was attached to the tube. One last roll here on my marver and then one tap on the end to make sure everything's lined up. And I think we have a nice looking tube right there. And the tubing might look a little small, but the walls are really thick. So as you blow it out into a sphere, it actually get pretty big. It is a scalable technique. You could make it of a larger size, maybe using a 26 millimeter tubing instead of this uh, 12 millimeter. But then there are also some other techniques that are great for making tubing, especially in large quantities. One, for example, is called the vac stack or vacuum stack. It basically involves putting a series of colored rods in between two tubings of clear and then vacuuming out the air as you melt the entire thing down. It does require a little bit of a larger torch and equipment like a vacuum pump, but you get a large amount of tubing and you can do different colors very easily. And now to switch things up, I'm going to change over to a blue slime and start to coil pot some of that on there. Real quick, I wanted to share a comment that I got on one of the videos, uh, a question. They noticed I kind of mentioned glass blowing and lamp working kind of in the same terms. And they were wondering what's the difference between the two. Well, traditionally glass blowing was done with a large furnace and it would heat the glass up with a radiant heat, kind of like an oven. They would also use larger two-handed blow tubes and they'd make big goblets or drinking vessels. So if you took a class for glass blowing, you might have uh, that traditional experience of working with the furnace. 
And now lamp working gets its name from the use of oil lamps to melt the glass. And what I've heard is that after the glass blowers would make their pieces in the furnace, they would then take them to the oil lamps to add little decorative finishes. And that does sound pretty cool, but we use the uh, newer technology today, these propane burners. They produce a slightly colder but wider flame compared to like a welding torch that uses acetylene. So if you were to take a lamp working class, you would expect a flame like this one. So even though there are definitely two different processes, I kind of just refer to blowing in the glass generally as just glass blowing. And my advice on taking classes though, I think it could be a good idea, especially if they give you enough torch time to see how much you like uh, working on the torch, but also if you don't have to invest too much financially just to take the class. You know, if you can buy the equipment and get started on your own and then it can end up being a lot more cost effective and then you can put a lot more of that money into your equipment instead of into that class and that's actually how i started a uh, glass blowing there's really a lot you can learn and practice just on your own and sometimes it's a lot better to have a base experience or a base knowledge of what you're doing so that way when you do take a class with someone that's more experienced than you then you will be ready for that advanced stuff and they're just not gonna teach you the basics. You know, some people just prefer more to have someone there to help them through it than others that just will learn more from just watching. If you're wondering about trying it yourself for like a hobby, can be done if you do have a little bit of extra money, but it can be kind of an expensive hobby compared to a lot of other ones out there. So that's why a lot of people that do get invested into it end up selling their work too. So for starting out with the basic equipment, it could run you anywhere from a few hundred up to over a thousand. But you know, even if it is basic equipment, if you just keep practicing and you just keep at it every day, you'll start to notice that practice just paying off. You know, in a few months, you'll start attempting projects and techniques that you would never even think of when you started and then in a couple years you could end up just being an amazing glass blower you know just whatever comes to your mind boom just make it and that's just kind of how i like to do things you know i just go into that creative process and get this idea and at times i just want to challenge myself to see if i can get it done you know like the glass cannon or the glass spinner a glass candle you know honestly i don't even know how that thing works it just does I got the idea from messing around with drinking straws when I was younger. And I won't get too much into it, but anyway, I was just excited it worked. It was really cool. And speaking of that, uh, something that I've heard from other glass blowers is they'll kind of get these cool ideas or some new project they want to do, but then they're kind of afraid to start on it. They kind of get this anxiety. And it's, it's kind of hard to explain unless you've been in the same place. But honestly, you just gotta just go for it. You know, that, that's my only advice because if it fails, then you'll be better about trying it again because at least you attempted it. And you'll also learn uh, what went wrong that time. But of course, if you succeed at it, then you'll be super stoked. Starting out, you run into a lot of fails. You know, things not heating in right or breaking apart once they cool. You might be putting, you know, three to four hours of time into something that just suddenly explodes in your kiln. <laughs> so there can be some disappointments, but you definitely do walk away more knowledgeable about what to do next. And now back to this project. Now, since I've coil potted up the different colors, I then began to blow out the end of the tube. And then I had to switch the blow tube to blow out the other side. And the reason I didn't blow out the middle section was because I would have lost stability and the piece would have collapsed. That's why I just focus on the ends and then I go in to fix the middle. But the middle here on this piece is a little bit too thin. So I went ahead and put blow tubes on both ends. And that'll just help me keep the ends stable. That way I can melt down the middle to thicken it up and to blow it out a little bit. This can be pretty hard to do because both of your hands have to work together. You know, if you end up moving one a little bit too far out, you'll end up stretching the glass out or collapsing it. 
And now with that center area thickened up and blown out a little bit, I'm gonna go ahead and remove one of the blow tubes. That way I can blow it out into a nice big sphere. Now it doesn't look as straight as a normal tube, or at least as straight as that first tube I did, but that's okay. Because as I heat it up and melt it back, that'll help even out those walls. And then as I blow it out, that also will help the process. As you heat it up and keep rotating it, it'll condense down and those thicker walls will eventually melt into the thinner walls. So it'll even out. And as you go to blow the sphere, the thicker areas will tend to hold the heat longer and will expand further while the thinner walls will lose their heat quicker and solidify faster. So naturally, the glass will just even out its thickness as it goes through that heating and blowing process. And you'll see that in the next video coming up, which I'm going to demonstrate the technique called the solid color blowout which is different from this technique where instead of making the tube like I did, I'm actually just gonna melt a big glob of glass and blow that out into a sphere. It's pretty cool. Now I'm gonna use my claw grabbers to remove the blow tube and to finish off the piece. And you do wanna splash a little bit of heat into the claws before you put it onto your piece because they'll act like a heat sink and will start to suck heat out of the glass very quickly and it could cause stress that will lead to a crack. And even though they do suck heat out of the project, it's not that bad because they do it in a very even way as it's all the way around it. So tongs and tweezers I find can be a lot worse because they'll take heat out of just one area. And it's when you get those differences in heat from two different areas is where that thermal stress comes into play. So as you set your project down, you have to be careful about the surface you put it on or if there's anything else touching it, a piece of glass or tool, and even the air itself. As the hot glass heats up the surrounding air, it causes it to rise, which then means the top half of your piece is gonna get more heat than the bottom half. And after a while though, you do get a good sense of how much heat's needed or when to reheat your piece. So if I feel like too much time has passed and one of the areas got too cool, I'll, I know just to throw it in the kiln without risking trying to work on it. And now that it's finished, here's the jar. And I really like it. I think the colors really pop. Some of these rods just have amazing colors. And that's kind of the fun part, all the different ones you can pick from. But that's going to do it for this video. Thanks for watching and make sure you subscribe so you can check out what's coming up next. But don't forget to have a great day.